Another voting scandal, sexist props, Eurovision stars turn politicians, and a year full of stars. Let's talk about Eurovision 1963. Welcome to Eurovision Histories, where I watch old editions of Eurovision so you don't have to. The eighth Eurovision Song Contest was held at the brand new BBC Television Centre in London after the UK took over hosting duties from previous year's winner France, who had already hosted the 1959 and 1961 contests and declined to do so again due to financial issues. The French giving the Brits something to shine? Eurovision must have been really expensive even back then. The BBC gladly took the occasion to show off their brand new television studios and all their technical possibilities. The setup was therefore rather strange. The audience, Katie Boyle, who hosted for a second time, and the scoreboard were in one studio, the performers in another. This allowed for the use of many props and gave the whole affair a very professional touch. We will talk about props and touching in a minute. Maybe a bit too professional though as rumors started to circulate that the performances had actually been pre-recorded and that was exacerbated by the fact that boom microphones were used and so no microphones were seen near the singers which made it seem like they were miming to pre-recorded tracks which was not the case. The number of participants stayed the same as in the two previous years. A map with a blinking light indicated which country the next performer would be representing which might have avoided some confusion as many non native performers represented several countries. Austria and Switzerland sent Israeli singers 10 years before Israel would make its own debut. Carmela Korin represented Austria with very progressive lyrics. and partly singing in English. Darling, you have made this a wonderful world. Esther Ofarim represented Switzerland with the beautiful Ton va pas. She came second, but many people thought that she should have actually won and only lost because of a Scandinavian voting complot, but more on that later. Luxembourg also again sent a non-native in Greek international singing sensation Nana Muscuri. Her song The White Rose of Athens had been an international hit before the contest and after it she would record over 200 albums in at least 12 languages. She also became a member of the European Parliament in the 1990s and was the first person to perform with glasses on a Eurovision stage. All of that didn't really help her because her A Force de Prier only came eighth. A force de prier chaque nuit, chaque jour. A force d'implorer tous les dieux de l'amour. She was one of many international stars competing in 1963. Monaco sent François Hardy, who had pressed more success into her short 18 years than many singers do in a lifetime, according to the BBC commentator. She was a chief representative of the Ye Ye music movement at the time, combining rock and roll, jazz, pop and chanson, and she released over 30 albums in her 50-year career. Her song L'Amour s'en va, came fifth and was one of her less successful songs. Vice Vukov represented Yugoslavia with the melancholic Brodovi. Bez 
He would return for Yugoslavia in 1965, but soon after that fell out of favor in his own country. After the 1971 Croatian Spring Movement, he was branded as a Croatian nationalist by Yugoslav authorities and his apartment was searched by police. As he was touring in Australia at the time, his wife could warn him not to return to Yugoslavia and he lived the next couple of years in France, only returning in 1976. His singing career by then was basically over. However, in 1989, a CD of his songs was released in Croatia, signaling the change in the political landscape. And in 2003, he was actually elected to the Croatian parliament. Ronnie Carroll, the UK representative that year, also turned into a politician later in life with the Make Politicians History Party, which called for the abolition of parliament and decisions being taken by referendums alone. He was never very successful, never entered parliaments, only ever receiving a maximum of 113 votes. He was more successful as a singer though and represented the UK again after his fourth place in 1962, this time with the song Say Wonderful Things. He came forth again, not for a lack of trying to improve as a result though, as he was swooned over by four accompanying women and there was even a kiss on the cheek, of course, they're not Danish. The use of women was all the rage in 1963 though. Representing France, Alain Barrière came equal fifth with François Hardy with his song Elle était si jolie. Elle est bien trop jolie. Et toi, je te connais L'aimer toute une vie Tu ne pourras jamais Oui, mais elle est partie C'est bête, mais c'est vrai he went on to have a string of hits at the end of the 60s and also had an image of a woman intercut with his performance. The cherry on the cake, however, was Emilio Pericoli, who literally had women as props and even kissed them. And now I've seen everything. He sang about professing his undying love to Julia, and then Claudia, and then Laura, and then Julia. He did wonders to keep up stereotypes about Italian men. Sorry? Oh, and sexism too. His Uno per Tutte had won the Sanremo Festival and it came third, Italy's shared best result with Volare. Oh, sulla bocca per voi, la 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 baci. E ed io li identico chi per prima di radici. Maybe it only makes sense that in a year like this, all four last places were women and all with the dreaded zero points. Annie Palman with Ens Beeldos for the Netherlands. The herder and the herderinnetje zijn nu voor altijd een paar. Anita Talaug with Solkwer for Norway. Oh, da! Laila Halme with Muistu Jeni Laulu for Finland. And Monika Zetterlund for Sweden with Engang i Stockholm. All of them stars in their respective countries could not convince any jury to give them a single point. With Sweden, Finland and Norway coming last, it might have been a disastrous year for the Nordic countries.
However, during the voting, Denmark took an early lead, which turned into a two-horse race between them and Switzerland. Several times during the voting, there was a tie between the two countries. When the voting got to Norway, there was clearly some confusion as the presenter did not present the points in the correct order. Here are the votes of the Norwegian jury. Song number one, England, five votes. Song number two, Italy, four votes. Song number three, Switzerland, three votes. Song number four, Denmark, two votes. Song number three, Germany, one vote. And that completes the vote of the Norwegian jury. However, here he had clearly given five points to the United Kingdom, four points to Italy, three points to Switzerland, two points to Denmark, and one point to Germany. When Katie Boyle asked him to repeat the votes in the correct format, this happened. Well, hold on, Norway. Hold on, Oslo. Just one moment. I'm afraid I shall have to give, ask you to give those votes all over again, because first you have to give the number on the board then the number of the name of the country. I don't think we did quite do that. Would you do it just again, please? All your votes, starting from number, whatever it is, one song. I don't know what number Hello, on the Hello, London. Board. Can you come back to Oslo? Oslo? May I come back afterwards to Oslo? Right. Yes, please. Katie Boyle called Norway again after all other countries had voted. Switzerland was in the lead by two points at that moment, and victory seemed all but certain. But now Norway announced the following result. Five points to the United Kingdom, four points to Denmark instead of two, three points to Italy instead of four, two points to Germany instead of one, and one point to Switzerland instead of three, which meant that Denmark had won. They were gasped in the audience on the night. 43. 43. I... Thank you very much, Oslo. And allegations of vote rigging, especially from the Swiss delegation, as Norway's Scandinavian Denmark had suddenly won against Switzerland. However, investigations by the EBU revealed that the first points announced were a preliminary result and not all jurors' votes had been tallied. The winners were thus Greta and Jürgen Ingmann, the first and only married couple to win Eurovision, with the beautiful and timeless song Danse Wiese. <laughs> Unfortunately, their marriage was less timeless and they divorced in 1975. Danse Wiese is still considered a Eurovision classic and was the first non-French winning song since 1958. I hope you liked this episode. If you did, please give it a like and please subscribe if you don't want to miss any of the other episodes on all the other years of the Eurovision Song Contest. Thank you and bye-bye.